Hi, I'm Jean Schumacher. I'm founder of Simply Plant Based, where I have a lot of programs to help you to change your health destiny, including just recently launched or gave birth to is the Pregnancy Advantage, where we want to help women to get their bodies pregnant ready. And if you're having trouble conceiving, we can help you there too. And today I have the absolute pleasure and privilege of interviewing Dr. Leanne Campbell, who is the founder and president of Global Roots. She's the Director of Community Services at the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies and the author of, oh, oh, just happened to have it right here, The China Study Cookbook with lots of notes because I write notes all over the place in my cookbooks. So thank you so much, Dr. Campbell, for taking the time to be with me here today. Thank you for having me. I look forward to talking to you. Oh, well. <laughs> I can't wait to dive in because I think in so many ways we've got so many parallels in our in our history and our backgrounds. So I'm excited to dive in. So let's start with your plant based journey. I mean, share with us how you began, or you know, going back to your family too. I mean, you have an impressive family. So just saying. Yeah. So my journey on this plant based diet or lifestyle began when we were in high school. And actually, it began probably a little bit before that. Slowly, it wasn't a really quick, immediate transition, but we started taking out meat out of our diet. That pretty much happened when I was in high school. And we started eating maybe meat once or twice a week. And when we did have meat, it was used more as a spice or, or as a like a scalloped potatoes. We would have little chunks of ham in it rather than just ham and potatoes little teeny, 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 teeny bits of it in the potatoes. And it began slowly. And then I actually went away to college at that time when that was happening. But pretty much at that point, we had stopped eating, you know, meat, but, but occasionally just a little teeny bit of and some of the casseroles that my mom made. And then when I came home from college, I would open the refrigerator and there was no milk in the refrigerator. There were the plant-based milks. And then the ice cream was gone. And then the eggs and the cheese was gone. And so they were making that, you know, that transition. And pretty soon they were 100% plant-based. But for me, I was in college and I was in a different place. I don't think I was as strict as they were. You know, we still had our late evening sort of ice cream runs, pizza, and all of that stuff. But for me, it didn't really begin until I went to the Peace Corps. And then when I was in the Peace Corps, and I was stationed in the Dominican Republic, and there were some incidences that sort of happened there that really made me start questioning my, my diet, it, more along the lines of uh, humanitarian, ethical reasons. And I just, you know, realized I, I'm going to be totally, I'm cutting this out completely. And it happened to be at the same point when my parents were also, you know, all his research was being, my father's research was being conducted. And so, you know, there are also the health reasons. But for me, I became really hardcore and serious about it for some, some slightly different reasons. And, and it was really at this point that I just decided, you know, when I raised my family, I was never going to have meat in the house, you know. It was specifically more vegetarian. It wasn't 100% vegan because we did have the occasional cheese, but pretty much it was really serious, you know, no meat at all. It wasn't as strict in the beginning, but then definitely after I had my children, we became 100% plant-based. And at that point too, a lot of the health reasons started kicking in. I was never a big cheese eater. I, and at that time too, I was pretty much 100% plant-based milk. So I would say I was like 95% vegan by the time I got pregnant. And then after I had my children, we were pretty much 100, close to 100% plant-based. So yeah, and then I, I had my children and, and they were raised, they're now 25 and 26 years of age, and they're raised completely on a, on a plant-based diet. My Did they oldest, have issues when they would go out with friends or you know, growing up? Well, you know, it's, it's, no, I don't think they did because from a very early age, I, I wanted them to feel comfortable about this decision and I wanted them to sort of like, you know, become aware of what it was that we're doing. And so I educated them on a lot of different sort of fronts too. 
I remember when they were like first and second grade, we visited a factory farm, talked about all of those issues related to, to our food choices with that. And they, they became, they're completely, they're completely into it. And in fact, they became almost my watchdogs. So if I slid just a little teeny bit, you know, if we were in the Dominican Republic and someone had prepared all this time a beautiful meal with a little teeny bit of fish stock, and goodness, if I ate a little bit of it, you know, for the next two hours after we left their homes, they were all over me. Mom, I can't believe you did that. But they, they are very serious. And um, they, they, you know, where did they get their protein from? My oldest son is now close to six, five. And, um, you know, and, and he obviously got it from his plants. So very healthy boys. Nice. Were they, were they yeah. ever sick growing up? So this is what made me actually become really, really strict with it. Because when they were younger, uh, they would get occasional ear infections. And my mom was always there in the back of my head saying, Leanne, it's that dairy. You need to stop all cheese. I know you said you just give them a little, little teeny bit on pizza, but you need to stop, stop all that cheese. And so I did. And I, you know, we're one of the few people that had the little pink bottle of antibiotics in our refrigerator, but pretty much a lot of people lived on those antibiotics, that little, and, and my sons, they're very, very healthy. They would go throughout, you know, the school year without hardly having a sick day. So well, I have to tell you, I mean, I started flipping through when I first got it. I, I thought I had every cookbook known to mankind, you know, but apparently somebody gave me a $50 gift certificate to Amazon. So I started flipping through the cookbooks and I'm like, oh, I don't have this one. So I got it. And like, first of all, the pictures are just exquisite. I mean, as I'm, as I'm skimming through this, I mean, you know, we've got pictures of you in, you know, looking out in your garden in the Dominican Republic. Oh my gosh. I mean, first of all, your cookbooks, I, I just can't tell you all the recipes in there. And I've tried several and I can't wait to, <laughs> there's a shortage right now on, on trying to get yeast because a lot of people are baking bread. I can't wait to make these samosas. So tell us how these cookbooks came to life. Okay. So the very first one, as I said, I raised my sons on this type of diet. And I was working full time. And I, at that time too, when they're in, in, in high school, I was a single mother. And so I didn't have much time when we came home from a very busy schedule. They both played soccer and after school activities, but I was really committed to making a home, you know, a, a cooking every night. I, I didn't like to, I didn't cook anything out of boxes or anything like that. So a fresh meal, and then we would all sit down together and eat. And they in turn would take, you know, what leftovers to school for school lunch the next day. So I was really committed to trying to do that with them. And I guess I, came, I became really good at making meals very quickly using, you know, just the simple ingredients. And we lived in Mississippi. We also lived in North Carolina, at Rochester, New York. After I graduated from UNC Chapel Hill, we moved to Rochester, then we ended up in Mississippi. So we lived in areas too where, you know, there were no, none of the specialty food items. It was just pretty, pretty much food lion and the produce, farmers markets or farm stands at that time. And, you know, just, just getting, you know, fresh produce and making something really fast and easy and delicious. So I think a lot of the, the recipes in my cookbook is, you know, it sort of focuses on, on trying to, to make, you know, without any of these exotic ingredients. And so when the first one came out, that was the focus. The second edition of that first cookbook, the one you just shared with us, that one incorporates a lot more from my garden in the Dominican Republic. So I, I, loved, I, I love to garden and I'm really getting into trying to grow all of my own food. In fact, I try to, right now I'm almost 100% sustainable. I have 82 different items growing in my garden. A lot of the recipes, there's 75 new recipes and a lot of them actually were inspired from what I do in the Dominican Republic in my garden. Well, there was one that had cocoa in it that was just so delicious. I made that and went, oh 
this is good. This is really good. <laughs> yeah, so we have 50 cacao trees. And so I make my own chocolate and I make my own cocoa powder. Yeah, that's one of my favorite, favorite desserts. I'm pretty much addicted to it. It's the banana, you know, the banana cream with some cocoa powder in it. No added sugar or anything. You just put it in your and your food processor and you blend that up and you just put some of the cocoa powder in it and uh i can eat that every night it's really good so oh my um, gosh i know that is i make popsicles you know and put them into a you know like a fudgicle kind of thing and, yes except and, i don't yeah. make my own cocoa powder so. yeah and i, <laughs> I we also uh-huh we also have avocado trees so i i, oh. I actually make fudgicles with avocados as well and, um, yeah, that would be pudding. dangerous for me. That would be it, dangerous. That's really right. Dangerous. I try to stick to the bananas, but yeah. Yeah, because so. like, yeah, you know, I'm still at this point. I've lost over a hundred pounds. So wow, yeah, fantastic. Like another person. I've lost a person. Goodness. <laughs> and how long have you been on this journey? Uh, it's been about ten years. And so okay. you know, for me, my trip started with a trip to the emergency room. And mm -hmm. sometimes you have to take a two by four and hit me over the head a couple of times, you know, to get my attention. Right. <clears throat> oh, yes. Yes. Got my attention. And what was interesting is the woman who treated me, you know, I had some kind of infection. My blood pressure was off the charts. I should have stroked out. I, I don't know why I didn't, but I think he had some plans for me. You know, uh -huh. I, I'm not done with you. I need your attention. Do I have your attention? Yes, sir. You have my attention. And the woman who treated me was not only a medical doctor, but she was a nutritionist as well which is such mm -hmm. a rare combination. And right. she started me on prevent and reverse heart disease by Dr. Wow. Paul Esselstyn. And I haven't looked back, you know. And, Fantastic. And so spent many summers at the farm up in uh, upstate New York at Dr. Paul Esselstyn's farm. Mm -hmm. And in the backyard, they had plant stock. And it, it was awesome. Just awesome. It's kind of like the Mecca, you know, for plant-based people. And you'd see the same people coming back every year. It was just, it was incredible. So Fantastic. That's, how, that's what I started. And I healed my thyroid, you know, I've mm -hmm. reversed fatty liver syndrome. I've wow. gotten, you know, reduced high blood pressure. My husband reversed MS. Wow. So, you know, the power of, of plants, I, you know, can't say Totally. It, it can really heal your diet. I mean, your body. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, totally. Without question. I mean, there's no if, ands, or buts. And I know if like I deviate, first of all, I'm very salt sensitive and I can't have salt at all. So mm -hmm. it makes it virtually impossible for me to eat out. And so we, we hardly do. I mean, and if we do eat out, it's a pretty rare treat. And I, you know, try and call ahead and say, you know, I'm plant-based, but no salt, no oil. And what can you do for me kind of thing. And, you know, most of the time I bring my, my purse. <laughs> You know, I bring my own dressing and, and, you know, just in case, because, yeah. but most of the time, you know, if I do, my blood pressure will go right up. It will mm. immediately escalate because, wow. you know, because of the salt. So, yep. well, where do you get the inspiration for your recipes? So uh, actually with that second book, then a lot of them came from my garden and, and it's almost, so this, a lot of the new recipes that I created. And it's whatever I have in season. Uh, several of the new recipes had has like a peanut sauce in it. So it's like a, and I have tons of kale growing in my garden. I have three different kinds of kale. I have, and, and it's now almost two or three years old. And so the kale comes up to my chest. That's how tall it is. It's, and I have three different varieties. And, you know, it's sort of funny because a lot of people say, oh, you can't grow kale in a warm environment. And I'm in the <laughs> tropics and I'm growing tons of kale. So I do, I, whatever I, I have, you know, if I have tons of tomatoes, I, it, so, so a lot of the new recipes in, included like this eggplant tomato soup, which I had at the time, lots of eggplants and lots of tomatoes. I have these stuffed cabbage rolls. Again, I had lots of cabbage at the time and, and I put a, like a tomato coconut sauce on top of it. We also have coconut trees. And if I don't I was just have say, them, you must have coconut trees. Yeah, we do. And if we don't have them, I, I go up the, a little bit further up the mountain and get some. But, and there's a banana, a green banana soup. And so green bananas, it, I'm sure you're familiar with it by living too in Latin America, but uh, green bananas with yuca. And Yummy. so it's, it's uh, pretty, pretty common in the Dominican Republic. 
So yeah, but usually uh, they fry it with lots of oil. Right, and I I boil it in this recipe, and so I also brew my own peanuts, and so you know I have this one recipe. It's, I write it as collards in the cookbook, but I make that one a lot, and that's with uh, sweet plantains, madores. Collards, I will take a couple hot peppers from my garden and mix that in with the collard or with the kale because that's what I have in my garden and tomatoes and some garlic and onions. And then I, I will crush, you know, some of my fresh peanuts from my garden after I've roasted them. I'll just sprinkle that on top of it. And oh, that's one of my favorite dishes. And I put that on top of the, the sweet plantains, which I bake. Um, the Madoras. And so, I'll, you know, a lot of the recipes in, include, a lot of the new recipes include all of these, you know, additions from my garden. So I have a lot of fun uh, just getting whatever I have in my garden. I have actually tremendous fun and looking at it and, oh, what can I do with this? So I have two acres of land and I have over, over 40,000 pounds of food that I produce on those two acres of land over a two year period. So 40,000 pounds over a two-year period. And I, I'm saying a two-year period because the gentleman next door to me, he has this, you know, cattle ranch. And he now needs almost two and a half acres for one of his cows, right? So over a two-year period, that's like at the most 400 pounds of, of, of animal flesh compared to my 40 thousand pounds of produce wow. on my two acres. Have you had a conversation and with him yet? Uh, yes, I actually have conversations with everyone around me because they, they come in and I'm creating these food forests. And it's a three-tiered type of garden where we have lots and lots of root crops. So I plant lots of the sweet potatoes and the yucca and yaltia and yami and different types of yaltia. We also have the beets and the carrots. And then I have, you know, well, peanuts. And then we have beans and we have all kind of like six different kinds of beans growing some you know on, that grow up high on the vines and some that are low we have you know then regular garden kale tomatoes eggplants peppers all of that oh we also have lots of squash the caribbean pumpkin and there are certain times of the year where i i get so many like 50 of them and they're like pumpkin size we share a lot of the food right so then we have a lot of the trees as well. I have all the bananas and the plantains and oranges and lemons and the chocolate, the cacao. And another, so there's, there's three different kinds of the bananas that we have on our, on our land growing. And all, lots of fruit. I have mandarin oranges, sour oranges, star fruit, pomegranates, jackfruit as now, well. Did you plan all this? Or was some of it there already? A lot of it, a lot of it. So a lot of it, we, we have planted. So like the pomegranates, the star fruit, the jackfruit, which I haven't really, it hasn't, it just started producing. A lot of it I did plant. All the smaller oranges, the Washington oranges, some a lot more mandarins. But I did inherit a little bit of it where there are like two or three mandarin orange trees on it. And oh my goodness, they produce an insane amount of, of mandarin oranges. And they're just the sweetest thing. And zapote, I don't know if you know a zapote. That's it's just as tall, taller than an avocado tree. It's a very tall tree, and it's the red fleshy fruit mm -hmm. with a big seed in it. So I do. I dehydrate a lot of my produce too, and I use that in, in a lot of the baking that I do. Do you, do you so, sleep at all, or? Uh, and so, so once you get your food forest going, it's. I have a couple guys who help me. It's actually minimal work, you know. Once once you get it all going, it's it, we don't do. I guess the traditional like my dad's garden with everything in rows and everything rowed, but you know, hoed between them. No, this is more of just uh, it. It's it, it. We just grow everything and sort of like like a food forest area. What we do keep the weeds down. Like you know, the guys will occasionally go in there and take care of, and and of course, you know, they'll they'll clean off the dead growth of some of the trees. So, yeah, I know. I had I lived in Honduras, and we had the banana trees, several different species of bananas and coconuts. So you know, constantly we had to keep those, you know, and they would scurry up like a monkey, you know. And I'm like, I, I can't even think how you do that. Um, their machetes and just you know start hacking at the tree and. Take yeah. down the dead stuff. So, 
that's what they do you do it quickly so i know i i'm like yeah. for me i'd be like i need an extension ladder three people to hold the ladder so what are yeah. some of your favorite recipes so favorite dishes my sons were raised on dominican rice and beans uh, just because it's a super easy dish it's definitely one of our favorites they say it's their comfort food and and when i prepare it though i have the rice and the beans and then on top of it i put a beautiful mixed salad the dominican beans are really good it's a squash base it's the caribbean pumpkin which is similar to butternut squash onions and garlic lots of onions garlic cilantro and in the dominican republic i have two different kinds of cilantro growing in my garden the broadleaf and then the you know the smaller one that we buy typically in the store so cilantro dominic i mean um, the onions and garlic and uh, tomato, you know, uh, concentrated tomatoes, sort of like a tomato paste or whatever. You can make your own it, with all the cilantro and the squash and the beans. And then on top of rice, it's and then on top of that, I put, you know, a salad. Usually I love beets, beets, tomatoes, cucumbers, you know, whatever grain I have. And and also I. I like avocados, and so we will cut up some avocados and then just Who a little bit of lemon. Who doesn't? I mean, please. Who doesn't? Yeah, and a little bit of lemon on top, and that's my favorite. I, they, I think that's my go-to meal, and we generally eat that in the Dominican Republic. Uh, it's the national dish. So uh, their big meal is at, at lunchtime. I, I like the stuffed cabbage rolls with the tomato, coconut sauce on it. There's lots of food I, I like to eat. Another one, too, that I make a lot is this hearty kale salad. Since we have so much kale and I try to eat my greens like as much as I can, at least, you know, every day or every other day, I'll have a big, big, you know, serving of my kale. And so I, I generally put, you know, rice in that and onions and, and chopped up kale, fresh kale and tomatoes and some more beets and and I also you know then I put I my sour orange on it and I can eat a bowl of that almost every other meal that's one of my favorites as well sounds good sounds good yeah well I'm I'm not sure about you but when I say I'm plant-based people think I eat just salads which couldn't be further from the truth so so walk us through a day of food for you more or less Okay, so breakfast, I mean, here in the U.S., it's a little bit different. But in the Dominican Republic, I generally have what I have grown on my land. And that is in the morning, we have a yuca, which is cassave. And that's a very popular breakfast meal. And I like to bake it, though. I, I don't know if you've ever had baked baked yuca. So Usually I boil fried. I remember from my days in South America, but not baked. And that's horrible. I mean, I, 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 but I figured out a way to make it almost just like that, Gene, and it's just as tasty. So I boil it, and then mm -hmm. I, after I boil it, then I just, you know, slice it into longer, longer um, strips. And then I add, you know, onion powder, garlic powder to it, and then I bake it. And I bake it until it's crocante. So it's in that, that crunchy, that crunchy. Yes. And it is so good. It's one of my, my favorite, favorite breakfast meals. And so I, I also make different kinds of salsa. I have lots of tomatoes growing in my garden. And when the tomatoes aren't in season, I actually have a, there's a couple other farmers in the area that I go and I buy a box from them. And, um, but I make different kinds of salsa, salsa uh, like a fresca, you know, and then a, uncooked salsa then a cooked salsa and i also make guacamole and then sometimes i have beans and i put the beans in with the with the salsa and blend it up and and then i just have that dip with my with my yuca or sweet potatoes i have a lot of sweet potatoes as well so i put that on my sweet potatoes i also make my own granola so oh. there are a couple times when I splurge and I go off and I buy oats. It's not grown in my garden, but I do make a big pan of granola and I use all my dehydrated fruits in that. Some of the shredded coconut, several almond trees in the area. So we get almonds from those trees as well. And I throw those in with it. I also grow soy. So I make my own soy milk and 
and I put that on my granola and so savory it's pretty much it or or boiled green bananas you know boiled green bananas boiled plantains I, I'm sure you remember all of those and so that's breakfast uh, dinner I mean lunch is the big meal during the day so generally it's that rice and bean dish I just talked about with a big salad on top of it and always like two sides so the sides generally are like eggplant guisada an eggplant puree or the or the tayote or you know whatever whatever we have also I use the greens to I'll cook up some greens occasionally but dinner I generally make soups so I have a really light dinner so I have a light dinner and some of my favorite soups the lentil soup that I make and I like making that dish because I take the lentils, whatever lentils are left over, and I puree them and I add, you know, some kind of breadcrumbs to it. And I, and I roll, um, add a little additional spices. And I have lots of oregano in my garden too, so I will throw some more oregano in it. And then I, I bake them and I have uh, my, my burgers, my lentil burgers. And so I save those for maybe the next evening. I'll have, so I'll have soup or I'll have, you know, a lentil burger, but generally I, or, you know, I'll have some kind of soup. I have like, whatever's grown in my garden, I have spicy pumpkin soup or an eggplant soup or the lentil soup, or, you know, just a, the banana soup that I told you about earlier, uh, whatever uh, I have, I just sort of throw that together, a be black bean soup. And then, for, and then so, so a soup or else maybe even my hearty kale salad or just a, another sal kale salad. There's so many varieties of kale salads. And then I generally have my banana cream I, for dessert before I go to bed. And nice I do cream. eat lots. Yeah. And I eat lots of fruit during the day. I eat lots and lots of fruit. One of your earliest experiences was in the Peace Corps. Share with us what you were doing and, you know, obviously we're stationed in Dominican Republic, but what were you doing? Sure. So my job was to rehabilitate malnourished children and I was assigned to work in a health care program. And I lived in a clinic in, the, in a rural area. And back in those days, 30 years ago, it was a very remote clinic. It was hard to get out of the village where I was during the rainy season. The roads were washed out. And in general, I mean, at that time, there was no electricity, very little electricity and no running water. So for two and a half years, bathing in the river, doing laundry in the river, and electricity was spotty. In the village I lived in, there wasn't even any electricity at all. So, you know, it, it, I worked in this program for, for two and a half years. And it was a very challenging program. Uh, I, what did I know? problems were so profound for me to address by myself. But what I did learn was that I, I could take care of maybe some of the basic infrastructural things that was causing uh, some of the conditions. And so mainly it was, was poor sanitation. Mm -hmm. A lot of the children were getting the diaries and, and, and um, that was the number one cause of death then because they later then had, uh, if they pneumonia came along and they're really, really skinny, they had it was, but anyways, so I, I built latrines, like 50 different latrines. I came back to the U.S. I raised some money visiting different churches and visiting the Rotary Club. And I took that money back down to the DR and I was able to work with the people in the village as we built three different schools, built like 50 latrines. We did community gardens. We did rainwater catchment tanks and we built like maybe 40, 20,000 gallon water tanks and schools and in the center of different home villages and near two or three clusters of homes. So trying to take care of the drinking water and then the, the latrine and then, well, then the schools too, that's something. And I say, I raised the money to buy the, the supplies, but it was really the village that provided all the labor and they did a tremendous amount of work. So getting it all built and put together. So, yeah, but you were the and, nucleus. Yeah, I was able to raise some of the, the funds and bring that in. And, and then we all worked together to sort of like do something with it. Do you and, ever go back? So uh, where I live now, I live in the same province where I did 30 years ago. But I don't live in the same municipal, which means that I live almost 40 minutes away from where I lived in the Peace Corps. 
And I, I don't go over too often to that side of the mountain. I'm like on the other side of the mountain. And, but it's identical, Jean. It's identical. I mean, the same kind of village, coffee and cacao, the cocoa. That's the number one and has always been the number one export crop in the area. Well, do you ever see some of the kids that you help save? I don't know if, I, I, I actually don't know if, if several of the children on my caseload actually passed away and they were so young. And so, no, I, I, I don't see them. And, and not only that, but they, I, I ended up because it was so challenging and what I was doing, I, I sort of self-selected to start working in some of these other larger community projects based on infrastructure. And I, I wasn't doing the one-on-one, -on -one, you know, originally what they had had me plan sort of focused on doing. And, and, and that, in those days, that was sort of the nature of the Peace Corps because my supervisor only visited me twice the entire two and a half years that I was there. And pretty, and both times that he came, I wasn't even there. So it was a lot of, we could sort of define in a way what we wanted to do. And so that's sort of why I, I, I started, and I was fortunate to live, and I left the clinic, and I moved in with a beautiful family, and they had, of the nine children, six of them were teachers. And so I lived with this family, and, and they're not only teachers, but they're amazing community leaders. And so when I raised the money, they, they taught me a lot about how to work within communities and how to get these projects done and stuff. So I just basically put the money in their name almost and said, okay, I'm, I'm here to do whatever I can do to support this. And of course, there was something to do every day with it. So, but I do see lots of the people that I worked with back then. I still see them. So a lot of them have left too as well and have moved on to the, and have gone, come to the United States. Yeah, that was 30 years ago. And then after I left the Peace Corps, I actually was not involved at all in the Dominican Republic for almost 25 years. I've had a career outside of the Dominican Republic. And it's just recently that I've returned. And so... Um, well, that, that ties right into my next question because, you know, your experience there, you know, you saw it like over 30 years ago. And then you came back and bought property and land and have started building. Well, how has it changed since you first were there? You know, the changes have been astronomical, Jean. First and foremost, most of the people in the rural areas have moved out. And I would say almost 70, 75% of the people have left the rural areas. Migration from the rural to the urban areas has, has totally changed the landscape in this part of the country. Before, there was a very a thriving community with lots of different community groups and associations. You know, they, they, because the government does not do a good job of really, uh, or they having the resources to, to sort, of, sort of support those in the rural area, they had to take care of themselves. And so they had a very amazing network of community groups that did exactly that. But now the, the area has pretty much been abandoned. You know, lots of abandoned farms. And the area that I live in, it's in La Cumbre. But if you walk there up the road, it's a dirt road, and further up that road, there used to be a village called Las Lirias. And it had almost 40 households in it, a school, a church, like four different stores, or houses and, and four different comados, there's now maybe three homes in that area. And so uh, it's, I think in, it, it's since so many people have left, the, at the same time when they left, they left mainly because there was a fungus that came through and killed 80% of their cat number one cash crop, which at that time in that area was coffee. And so they left because all their coffee died and they went into the went to the urban areas and they ended up selling their land to a wealthy landowner in the area that was buying up everybody's land and oftentimes this was a person who had a home in the US and a home in the Dominican Republic and and Dominican of course but they it was easy for them to farm the land by having cattle raising livestock it's a lot more economical to raise cattle rather than converting your land into agricultural uses it, because it, the 
costs are so expensive, right? Where with a cattle ranch, you just have to hire somebody to take care of the fences, to go around, make sure the cows are staying in because it's all grass fed and making sure that they have enough water. So basically that's what happened. As these families left, I have a, their land right beside me, a thousand acres have been cleared. Before they were like canucos, the food forest, small food forest. It's been thousands and thousands of trees have been taken down. And it's not just beside me. It's throughout the entire mountains. I, I do a lot of hiking. I try to walk like, you know, hike 20 miles a week or so every day, three or four miles, four or five miles every day. And, and I, I generally hike in the mountains just around. And, and the deforestation has been astronomical. What has caused the deforestation? Mainly the food system, you know, cleared for cattle, cleared for cattle. And then the rivers have dried up as well because of this. And then the trees have been cleared. It's now hotter there than ever before. We're getting new records almost every year and less and less rain. So more and more droughts and the rivers are being dried up. And then, you know, the deforestation. So the environmental changes. And, and oh, another thing too is I was putting together my garden. You know, I would oftentimes go and, and you could buy seeds and like the Ministry of Agriculture always had like native seeds and a tree nursery. Now I, I can't find any of that. It's like everything that I, that you can go to a private nursery. They have like a genetically a hybrid type plant. But so I bought all my oranges. I was excited. I planted them. And I was told after I got them in by some of the local farmers that, you know, you'll only those orange trees because they're dwarf trees within five years, you need to replant, replant them. So the native orange trees, which can last for like 80, 90 years, I can't find those anywhere, nowhere. And so we're also trying, I mean, here in the center, we're also trying to, to grow our own trees now. So as we hike around, it's like, oh, wow, look, there's a native orange tree. Let's get some of the seeds. We'll bring them back. And I plant them. And so I have a big, I have a nursery of like, a, you know, 150 trees or so. And so we plant them and then I take those and we share them. We give them out to as many as people. It's sort of like trying to can do that conservation thing too. Growing your own food is an act of conservation, right? It is. And Absolutely. so. Um, well, you started Global Roots. So share with us how that came to be and what are you working on? Okay, so Global Roots is actually more of an education program with my, my background is in education. So my doctorate is in, and it's in education, culture, curriculum, and change. And so we have groups come down and I've worked with lots and lots and lots of high schools. And we have actually done even teacher study tours and to curriculum development program and college students as well. And they come. And basically, it's about it's a lot of the issues that I'm talking about. All of our programs currently engage them in trying to look at the environmental changes, at projects and what we can do, how we can heal the land. Just like we can heal our bodies with a whole food plant-based diet, when we, you know, grow in a sustainable fashion, whole food plant, you know, grow food and sustainably, we can also heal the earth. We are doing a regenerative land project with the students. And we're trying to bring back a dry riverbed by reforesting the area, but with a food forest. And we're doing it in partnership with families in the village. And we're trying to work, do this on the land that the cattle ranchers own. And so in the end, they get to keep 50%, the cattle rancher, because it's their land. The farmers keep the other 50%. So, and we do lots and lots of water projects. So regenerative land projects. And, and but more than that, it's an immersion experience where the students are, I would say, not only do they learn about these issues, but they're transformed and they're inspired to take action in their own communities. And when they leave, you know, it's, it's a very powerful experience. Uh, yeah. uh, you can talk about this in textbooks from far away, but if you're there and you're seeing it and you're feeling it and you're smelling it, it goes into your heart and you want to do something about it. It's a different experience. It's true. So, it's true. Yeah. Well, now you're directing community service at the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies. What's going on here and what do you hope to accomplish doing this? So it's a part-time position, and, and it's a, but it's a whole new endeavor. The, the center has been pretty successful, quite successful with the certificate program. 
And so now it's an opportunity for us to give back to the communities and to inspire and engage others in sort of this message. But it's not about only, it's also about taking action within our own communities. And it, I'm basing it on those principles of resiliency and regenerative. You know, a whole food plant-based diet for one's personal health can not only regenerate ourselves, like you shared with your stories, and provide, you know, a new lease on life, but it can also, it provides resiliency in terms of like times of like flus and stuff like that, you know, we can withstand. The, we're also doing it as well for the food systems you know, trying to provide more access to healthy foods and urban areas that where, and so we're giving out grants. We're going to be giving out grants at the same time. We're creating a program where we are also trying to raise funds to support our, these community initiatives. Wow. Uh, and so we're trying to get the word out, but through service and, and trying to give as many, uh, starting as many, uh, supporting as many groups as we can, sort of spreading the word about you know a whole food plant-based diet on like not only how it can heal ourselves but when grown in a sustainable fashion as well can heal the earth so So, um we can't we can't keep doing what we're doing absolutely not that's right i'm glad there's people like you out in the world that are helping us to change yeah So. so well what advice can you give to someone who is considering changing to a plant based lifestyle uh i think that the best thing to do almost is to educate yourself. I think there are so many reasons why you want to become a plant-based, you know, this lifestyle. And, and it is a lifestyle choice, you know. And, and I think, I think it's, it's not just not eating this food, but it's also trying to, to play with this food and to get into it and to like even trying to grow some of it yourself and get in the kitchen, slow down, take some time to try to prepare something and be caught, be patient with yourself. You know, maybe it, you're not going to get all the tricks right away in terms of cooking really tasty meals, but find a few that you really like and that really work for you and then try to expand upon that. But I, I think though it's really key to at the same time is to try to educate yourself as much as possible because sometimes it's, it's, oh, I want to eat this. It's so good. It's tasty. But then if you know the environmental implications, uh, ethical, and, and when you start looking at it from all of those perspectives, it's like, yeah. no, absolutely not. I'm doing this for other reasons greater than myself as well. So I, that's the advice I would give. Well, I think you're right. And that's one of my hallmark statements is it's key to keep educating yourself because that's me. I'm an educator. And that's what my doctorate's into is curriculum and instruction and science and environmental science. So chemistry. So that's, you know, it, it, you nailed it because part of this is learning and it's not just, you know, for me, I talk about it, what I call a trifecta. So you have to change what goes in. So food and drink, then you have to change what goes on. So personal care products or the environmental toxins you're being exposed to. And then you have to exercise, you know, just let me give you an example. Like my husband and I were out for a walk the other day and literally these people, they were power walking and they went by us and that's great. So, but we could smell, they had bounce, you know, or like a fabric softener and it was just perfuming their clothes. And so as they went by, we could smell them and then and they, they were long down the road and we could still smell from them. And a lot of those chemicals, that, that smell that smells nice, you know, from the dryer coming out, those are all, it's chemicals. And these are all toxins that you are being exposed to. And you're breathing this in. If you can smell it, you're breathing it in. And we were behind them just smelling this. And I, my husband's like, oh my God, I can't believe that. You know, how strong it was. And I said, yeah. And I said, uh, because once you start to get rid of these toxins out of your life, you're very sensitive to them you know, afterwards, you know, so, Mm -hmm. well, Dr. Campbell, it has been amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with me here today and to share your story. What a story. Wow. Amazing. Well, thank thank you you. for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks. Well, we will definitely be connecting again for sure. Okay. Sounds great, Jean. All right. Okay. Take care.